Viewers might like to know that due to the Queen's Golden Jubilee, schools' programmes will not be transmitting between the 3rd and the 7th of June. For more information, go to bbci at bbc.co.uk slash schools slash what's on. To celebrate the Jubilee, the BBC brings you one incredible classical music concert live from the gardens of Buckingham Palace. Starring Angela Gheorghiu, Roberto Alagna, Dame Kirita Karnawa, Mislav Rostropovich and Thomas Allen. Prom at the Palace, Saturday the 1st of June, 10 past 8 on BBC One. Now on BBC Two, working lunch with Adrian Charles and Adam Shaw. Welcome to Working Lunch. I'm Adrian Charles. The directors of Equitable Life are facing flat from disgruntled members. We'll be hearing from the AGM. On the markets, Unilever, the firm that makes fish fingers and Hellman's mayonnaise, has signed the biggest advertising deal in British history. And Punch, that's the pubs group, is toasting its stock market debut. Mortgages. There's a call for more mortgage rates to be fixed for the full term of the loan in order to get stability in the housing market. And coming up to learn to dance in your boss's time. It's all true, we came along to the Land Rover plant at Solihull to find out how things have changed over the years. You'll be amazed at what we found. And some of your golden wonders. Noel and Jerry here were married back in 1952. They're going to tell us what it was like then and a few home truths about the way we live now. The directors of Equitable Life are facing the wrath of members today. It's the Mutual's first AGM since its deal to end its billion pound liability over pension policies with guaranteed returns. Members have criticised the Equitable's directors for using future profit expectations to boost its financial position by half a billion pounds. Earlier we spoke to members as they arrived for the meeting and they weren't happy. Today is absolutely crucial to us all. Uh, what we want is stability, we want certainty from our society and we really haven't got that at the moment. This is a petition that's been signed extraordinarily by 20,000 policyholders in two weeks asking Vanny Treves to immediately address our archaic constitution and governance. They're very inventive about, about their accounts and how they could possibly, uh, uh, for example, uh, look ahead and choose about 500 million that they may make and add it to the figures to give everybody the impression like me that they're stronger than what they are. I just, it's just unbelievable. So much so that I want to come and listen to it myself today. It's the members. This is the boss of the Equitable, Vanny Treves. The society was in intensive care. We are now in a nursing home. We occasionally go for walks and we smile. That's a much better position to be in than we were a year ago. I am confident that in future we will do even better. The meeting kicked off more than an hour ago. Russell Hayes is there. There was a very neat or tortured, if you like, extended metaphor there from the boss. How's that kind of talk going to go down there? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, you know, people are very upset about this in this building behind me, Adrian, as you can imagine. These are people's retirements and lives at stake, and in some case, they're being shattered by what's happened. So we've got a lot of release of steam here as they get chance to uh, question the executives, but it's very measured release of steam because uh, so far, the sorts of people that we've had asking questions have been very well versed in the functions of a, uh, of a uh, pension company. So that these are, it's a very genteel occasion, but nevertheless, the questions that keep coming back are, uh, are you being honest, were you using cre creative accounting uh, uh, to, to do this, are our pensions secure? And that's a, a, a theme with pretty well every question. And Vanny Treves, as we heard in that clip there, is really going out of his way to say, look, whatever you've read in the press, whatever you've seen about a, alleged creative accounting, which he absolutely repudiates, the fact is that if we are, the measure of, of solvency is do we have enough assets to pay our liabilities? Yes, we do. We are, in, we are therefore solvent and there is no danger in the near term of us not being solvent. If there was one thing you'd pick out as the members being most angry about, what would it be? 
Well, I think it would be that, really. I think uh, allied to that, Adrian, people don't feel that society has been uh, honest with them. One member said it's been a year of obfuscation and spin. Uh, when does it stop and when do we get uh, a proper answer? Uh, and allied to that, I mean, others were saying, look, you know, this was creative accounting. You weren't actually being honest with us. You were trying to make things look better th than they were. And Vanny Trees, the chairman, said, I repute absolutely the allegations that we use creative accounting. Uh, the accounts were signed off by the auditors. There were then shouts of Enron, Enron from the back of the uh, the hall with people uh, applauding. So people really don't feel that, that the society is being straight with them. When you bear in mind that uh, the chairman and chief executive are possibly going to get something like half a billion in bonus payments, that really just adds salt into the wound. Can anything change as a result of this AGM? Well, I, I think um, uh, that certainly the, the, the chairman, chief executive and the board are getting the message of members that uh, they really don't ought not to be seen to be, I mean, they repudi repudiate that they have, but ought not to be seen to be using any sort of financial trickery over this. There is that, of, of course, that petition saying that they need to uh, reform the structure so that it's easier for members to hold them to account. And interesting, the petition itself is an example of how difficult it is. If they'd actually wanted to get a change, they would have had to have 20,000 signatures in several weeks before the meeting, which they couldn't manage. So I think the, the board is getting the message, look, play straight with us, keep us properly informed. Okay, Russell Hayes, thanks very much. Russell Hayes at the Equitable Life uh, AGM. The other business news, up to 450 jobs are to go at the NEC computer plant in Livingston. The company says it's closing the factory to cut costs and will move production to China. It's the final blow for the Livingston plant which shed nearly 2,000 jobs last year. NEC says it lost nearly £2 billion in the last financial year because of a slump in the market for personal computers. Gerald Ratner is getting back into the jewellery business. Mr Ratner, you remember, was famous for building a multi-million pound jewellery empire business and then rubbishing the quality of his own products. The company lost millions in sales and half a billion pounds was wiped off its share value. His new venture will be an online jewellery business. And a fifth of workers don't bother to eat lunch. And women are more likely to skip lunch than men. This is according to fascinating research by Findus. A quarter of workers spend more than three pounds on lunch each day. That's 750 pounds a year. The markets, Adam. Well, share prices have been moving up this morning. Not a huge move. Vodafone report their results tomorrow. They're already in the news. That's because there's growing pressure on the company to write off a large portion of their assets to reflect a downturn in the market. A bit of technical mumbo-jumbo. What it really means is they own a lot of things. The pressure is to reduce the value of those things in their annual report. If they do that, it would cut their profits. The pressure is there because the argument is, well, the whole telecom sector has gone down, so there is less value out there. We'll have to see what actually happens, but we'll know tomorrow. Got to tell you, though, the share price hasn't been doing well recently. Vodafone shares were £1.80 at the start of January. Uh, where are they now? Uh, one fourteen now, so up a penny, but, uh, but way down, even where they started uh, this year. Here's a brief look at some of the more widely held shares. And you can see uh, certainly a predominance of shares rising. BAA down half a penny, BT down six, Glaxo, SmithKline down 19, ICI down seven, Scottish Power down three and a half, and Tesco's down three pence. I hope you managed to grab your favourite there. Now GWR, they own a radio station called Classic FM. They reported full year pre-tax pre-exceptional profits of £7.68 million. It's a big drop. It is a 62% fall on last year. Final dividend is three and a half pence. That fall is largely due to a big fall in the advertising revenues, which we've talked about a lot recently. Now they say that they've seen some growth in those revenues this month, but they're not sure whether that's down to a one-off World Cup factor or as a result of some more lasting confidence. GWR shares actually, despite all that news, up over 7.5%. City obviously uh, was, uh, was expecting even worse or fearing even worse. Unilever, as I said a few moments ago, it signed the biggest advertising deal in British history. A four-year £320 million deal with Carlton Communications and Granada shares. Bizarrely, Unilever is up and the people he's paying the money to, Carlton Granada, are actually down. But that's the way the market's going. Down around, or oh, about half percent there, and a one percent move on Carlton Communications. 
Wolverhampton and Dudley Breweries, I think it's our biggest regional brewer, they reported half yearly pre-tax profits of £31.3 million, up about 2% on last year, interim dividend at 9.9 pence. The company also announced it's decided to return £50 million to shareholders. It will do that by offering them cash for their shares. If you are a Wolverhampton and Dudley shareholder, expect a letter in the post sometime soon. Their shares, though, unchanged, 702 and a half. Black's Leisure, they reported full year pre-tax profits of £12.4 million. That's a drop of 14% on last year. Final dividend, four and a quarter pence. Black's Leisure shares, uh, they're now trading at uh, up 4% at 254, so a good performance there. Punch uh, will start trading today. It now stands at 247. No change because it is its first day of formal trading. But I believe I remember them being originally sold at 230. So from their flotation price, we are seeing a rise. MMO2 doing well. Cable and Wireless doing well as well. So some strength in, in that um, uh, telecom sector. And Shire Pharmaceuticals not doing well. Worst performing FTSE 100 share of the morning. Brokers downgrading might have been behind that, seeing them down 3%. FTSE 100 index, it wasn't doing very much earlier. It was slightly up, and it's still slightly up. One point doesn't even register as a percent move. Six, oh, and and as, I, as I speak, it tells you it's doing absolutely even less. Now, uh, that's, if you can contain yourself, it's the Jubilee Bank holiday this Monday and Tuesday, and we're heading into the summer, so it's worth looking at what you'll get for your pound. I've got to tell you, the pound's been getting weaker. You get uh, the following. 44.85 Czech Krona, uh, 1.5225 Swiss francs, 1.4120 US dollars. Uh, let's have a look at the euro if we can. No, was there no euro there? Uh, no, no euro there. Uh, but uh, what we try to do also is get you some of the better deals from the, the better known places. This is what £100 gets you from Travelex. It gets you €140. Euros. From Thomas Cook, it gets you €146. Euros. From Marks and Spencer's, €153. And Post Office, €151. So we're actually, from some of the biggest names, the Marks and Spencer's offering the best deal. Not an exhaustive survey, I can tell you, but interesting nonetheless. It does show you that, it, as Gillian always says, pays to shop around. Should be saying exactly the same shortly, I expect. <laughs> Mortgages to fix or not to fix. You may consider fixing your mortgage for three or five years, but the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors is today calling for Britain to adopt European style mortgages with interest rates fixed for the full term, the whole 25 years or whatever. What's their logic in asking for this? Well, their main point is that in Europe there's a huge amount of stability in the housing market and in this country, as we know, there is tremendous volatility. Prices go up, prices go down, although they haven't been going down very recently. Um, and there's much less boom and bust on the continent and I think one of the reasons is this. Um, the other thing is that from an individual's point of view, it gives far more stability for them too. They know exactly what their outgoings are going to be for the full period of the 25 years. Therefore, it's much easier to budget because if you have a variable rate, it's quite conceivable that over the period of the 25 years, your uh, mortgage payments will double, may triple. I mean, what I've done is looked at base rates over 25 years, just going backwards, and had a look at what those were. Let, let's take a look at those. Now, I emphasize these are base rates and they're not mortgage rates, but as we know, mortgage rates, uh, rates track base rates more or less towards um, 1% to 2%. They're fairly close to them. And look at that. I mean, at the moment, as we know, um, base rates are 4% and mortgage rates are at around the 5% mark. But look, I mean, 16% hasn't been rare. 14% hasn't been rare. And so had you fixed over the 25-year period somewhere in the middle of this, it may have considered, given you an enormous amount of peace of mind and you could have sniggered while your neighbours were yeah. paying those huge rates, um, uh, variable rates, and you were on a fixed rate. But obviously it all comes down to how much you fix that. Uh, does, does anybody want one of these things? Well, some people must want them because there are a couple of them out there. We've scoured the market today and there were two. Let me show you um, the two that there were. Oh, wait, let me talk to you first yeah. about um, the variable rates um, because what, what, what this will then lead up to is that the rates that are out there for long fixed rates are not so advantageous. Variable rates are the most advantageous in the marketplace. So here you are, 3.7, 3.84, and 3.89. I mean, these are phenomenally low rates, and we've just seen the base rates yeah. being 4%. These but are below 4%. But, but these are discounted rates, but aren't these they? But these are discounted rates, yeah. and the discount only lasts for a couple of okay. years. So if you wanted to go for the absolute cheapest, don't fix, go for a discounted rate. If we look at fixed rates, let's carry on then. 
and C. There we are. There are those 25-year fixed rates. And it's worth saying that they are considerably higher than the variable rates we were looking at. And so to get that stability at the moment, you are forfeiting potentially 3% interest okay. On the rate other hand, you're laughing if those variable rates shoot upwards to 8 or 9% in four or five years' time. Which is at that not point, you're inconceivable laughing, yeah. given what has happened in the past. It depends really, doesn't it, on whether we believe Gordon Brown that it is the end of boom mm -hmm. and bust or whether we don't. But worth bearing in mind again that you know, if we go into the euro, what's likely to happen is that interest rates will come down rather than go up. But fundamentally, the reason we could only find two of these in the marketplace is that not very many people want them, as Paula John told us. Put quite simply, there's no demand for 25-year fixed rates in this country. People don't want to commit for that length of time. They want to keep their options open and see what happens to the market, what happens to interest rates. So people are going for shorter, usually two- and five-year fixed rates. That's a very good idea. They give you security, they give you peace of mind. But also, the longer term, 25-year fixed rates are not going to be nearly as attractive looking as the shorter fixed rates because long-term interest rates are much higher than short-term interest rates. I mean, this was one key part of what they were saying in this report, the RIC survey, which is really a thought piece about how to get more stability into the housing market, how to make it a much better marketplace, because it doesn't yeah. work fundamentally very well at the moment. And what they're saying is that it's very low down on the political agenda. Every time that house prices go up, yes, it gets headlines, but there are far more factors to the housing market than simply house prices going up. And so one element they were talking about, for example, is the private rented sector. And they're saying, again, compared to Europe, they're saying, let's lift our heads above the parapet and let's look at how things are done in other countries in Europe, in America, in Canada and so on the private rented market is 11% um, of the housing stock here. In continental Europe it's much much higher than that, in the US it's much higher than that as well and what they're saying is that it's so low people would like to rent but they can't rent, the properties aren't out there at the moment and the reason is that landlords are in there for the short term rather than for the long term what they're saying is that landlords, I like their phrase they said they're traders rather than investors most landlords typically are small guys who go in. The typical portfolio is apparently seven properties, so people are not doing this on a big scale professional um, level. They go in, they buy their seven properties, they do them up, they sell them off after two years. So again, that doesn't encourage stability. So what they want is different tax treatments and more priority given to the rental market so that large companies will come in, will buy a hundred properties, will hold on to them and not just have these seven properties which are bought, sold and traded on. Gillian, thanks. A quarter of us lack the skills we need to do our jobs properly, as regular viewers to the show will know, and uh, 12 million of us failed to receive any workplace training at all last year. This from the research company Mori. But it's not all doom and gloom. Rob's with a company that's not only providing job training, it's also paying its workers to take up pottery, amongst other things. Rob? Yeah, amongst many other things, actually. There's a very different picture here to that survey because this is a company that insists that all of its workers get at least one day's training every year. This is the Land Rover plant in Solihull and it was recently taken over by Ford. They put a big emphasis on training. In fact, they've even got a scheme whereby, whereby workers can apply for a grant as long as the training is nothing to do with their job. Now, it's led to a big change in culture and some very unusual skills amongst the workforce. Two years ago, Ford took over one of the most famous motoring names in the world, but it knew then it was looking at a big bill to improve it. Since then, more than £300 million has been spent on new processes and equipment, but much of the emphasis has gone on boosting staff morale, including a new programme which allows employees to take training courses of up to £100 as long as it has nothing to do with their job and stand by for one of the strangest things you'll ever see on a factory floor. So I gather you've got quite an unusual hobby. What's yours then? Um, at the moment we're doing flamenco, me and myself and the wife. Um, we've been doing it now for about nine months and uh, it's a very good exercise. Uh, I recommend it to anybody and uh, pluck the courage up, have a go. Now you've mentioned flamenco dance and I've got to ask you, can you give us a demonstration? <laughs> go on. I, I could do a few moves for you perhaps. And, uh, go on, take but, it away. Uh, <laughs> my instructors may, uh, may take me, but if you, you want me to do a, a move, yeah? For you, yeah, it's up to on, you. Yeah. Okay. I don't know about the lads behind or something. I'll stand so they can't oh, see okay. you. Just ignore them. And it's not just the flamenco dancers who've noticed a change in emphasis. I think it's the way the uh, Ford have actually embraced the workforce themselves. Instead of uh, looking at them as a commodity, you know, the, uh, the way we've sort of like pushed us forward for the uh, courses. Uh, and the way they, uh, they care about their associates. 
It hasn't all been good news though. Around 1,500 jobs have been lost through voluntary redundancies. But Ford has serious plans for this plant, aiming to boost production from 170,000 vehicles a year to 275,000. It doesn't envisage creating any more jobs to do that, and so a happy workforce will be vital. Will they do it? Well, Bob Dover is managing director here at Land Rover. Now, Bob, why are you so keen on training? I mean, you spend a lot of money on things that don't obviously benefit your business. World class in terms of our product. We've got to be world class in terms of our workforce. So, yes, everyone gets training, and that includes me too. We try and give people at least two or three days off, off the site every year to improve their skills and to keep up with things that are going on. And I think it shows also how much we respect our workforce, because we want to. We want them to feel comfortable and part of a great company. And what do you get from some of London Flamenco dancing? Uh, probably directly very little, because he isn't going to teach me, because I don't want to know. I'm happy <laughs> to watch it. But no, a sense of respect, a sense of fulfillment, doing something they've always wanted to do, I think is just great. And something they can feel proud that the company supported them. Now, it's two years since Ford took over this plant. Where do you see it going? How, I mean, how things, first of all, let's just find out how things gone in those two years. Um, it's been interesting, but right now we're looking, <laughs> very, we're looking at a record year for Land Rover sales. Mm. We've just launched this car behind Range Rover worldwide. We're still rolling it out. It goes to North America this month. Um, new Freelander going to the, uh, North America as well. So we'll have a record year. That will be driven by North American growth. So things are looking very exciting. But interesting, it's usually managing directors speak for difficult. Has it been hard? It's been hard, but we've had a great collaboration with the team here. We've put a lot of money into the site. We've put 200 million. You're looking at that behind me now in terms of the factory. 2.5 billion is coming our way in terms of spend for new models. So uh, an enormous amount we think we can do with the commitment and the skills that are here. Now when Ford took over companies like this, like Jaguar, which you also, you're also head of, there was a feeling that they couldn't handle that kind of top end of the market. Yes. Is, this, is, is this investment a way of saying, yes, this is how we do it? No, I think uh, the Jaguar experience proved everybody wrong. And Jaguar's gone from a tiny company with not so good quality to a big company with great quality. And it's an example, I think, to all of the, uh, the industry here in the UK. And certainly a model that we can use here at Land Rover. So what are your plans for this plant then? Where's it going to go? Bigger. Better. But more productive with a better train and a comfortable workforce. And where are the markets? I mean, who's going to be buying Land Rovers? We sell in 142 countries around the world. I mean, this is probably one of the most complex vehicles on the planet, and we'll continue to do that. But the, great, the growth is really the US, Canada, Mexico, then the UK, and then the European countries. So we're everywhere, and we want to be everywhere. But I mentioned in my report that you're going to have 100,000 extra vehicles with pretty much the same workforce, in fact, smaller than the old workforce. Yes. I mean, how do you manage to do that, really? Well, with automation. Behind us, you can see the automation that helps marry the chassis to the body on the new Range Rover, with a lot of investment in computer tools and computer software as well, a lot of lifting uh, equipment so that people don't have to bend and carry and lift and move just making the place more effective and making it to world-class standards. And of course, Land Rover for a while had this, was dogged by problems of quality standards. Well, how, did, how did you address them? We've got some very good processes to help us improve quality and we've deployed them all. We're very proud of what we're doing here in terms of improving the quality. You think and you've looking after those, the customer. Hmm? You think you've conquered those problems? No, I think quality is a journey uh, and we'll keep going and we'll keep getting better. But the level we're at now is very competitive. OK, Bob, thanks very much. And you will have a highly educated and very talented workforce on the way. So good luck with it. Sam. It's back to you now. Very much. The Jubilee is approaching. With that in mind, we ask you for your memories of 1952. Loads of you have responded. Simon's met one couple having their own golden celebrations this year. Nineteen fifty two, the age of steam still and of post war shortages. Everyone keen to save a little money. Luxuries like oranges and bananas were seldom seen. But things were changing. Wartime ID cards were abolished, and some rationing of tea, for instance, was stopped. In this world of doing without, Jerry and Noel embarked on their life together. Arriving independently from Ireland, they were married in fifty two in Luton. At that time, I don't know what Jerry was on at that I time. That was twelve pounds a week. Twelve pounds, and I was on three pounds seven and six a week. Yeah. Six day a week. Oh my goodness, there it is. Noel has, of course, kept her wedding dress, Isn't bought for seven pounds. Right, and then there was the wedding to pay for. On top of that, 
the whole lot, the bill for the whole lot of flowers and um, the hire of the hall and the, the meal and the three tier cake and the cars, the whole lot is £25. So we have a wedding dress which cost £7, a wedding which was £25 on top of that, wages of £3 and £12 a week and a house they moved into which cost £1,750. But how do those prices really compare with what you'd pay nowadays? Let's have a look. Starting with the dress then, that's the equivalent now of £125, although the average spend on a wedding dress today is said to be £900. The wedding itself, £25, that's 446 in today's money, but again we spend more. £12,000 is a common figure for how much people spend on the celebrations now. Jerry's 1952 wages of £12 a week as a travelling salesman, more than most people earned then, translate into £214 now, but the average wage these days is £490 a week. Finally, the house, 1750 then, adjusting for inflation, that's £31,200, but the average price of a house now is £121,000, so we have more to spend and more to spend it on. In an age when the building effort was going into council homes, Noel and Jerry were the exception, managing to buy a new house of their own. Then, as Britain got back on its feet, they moved on to a more comfortable life, training as pub managers with Whitbread, earning themselves a pension. But they still think people today don't realise how lucky they are. You know, we've seen, when you save all year for one holiday, you know, and in the end, we ended up with having two holidays abroad a year. You know, that's a big difference, isn't it? But do you feel that you were, you were hard up at that time? No, well, we never thought about it. No, no, you didn't, did you? It didn't, didn't that think was about it. it. You had so much money and at the end of the week you were broke, and finished, composed. Mm -hmm. Now the completion of 50 golden years of marriage is a good Thank excuse for going through the wedding day telegrams once again the start of Noel and Jerry's journey from a time of rationing to a time of plenty. There'll be more Jubilee memories on the programme tomorrow and there are even more on our website www.bbc.co.uk slash working lunch. Check them out, they're lovely. A couple, um, a couple here, Pete Farrell's been in touch with us. He was 18 in 1950, uh, 1952, earning £5 a week. Uh, then he was called up to the National Service in the RAF. Uh, imagine my reaction when I picked up my first week's pay, £1 and 8 shillings, only one forty. I liked it so much, I eventually served for 22 years, he said. Um, also, uh, also Katerina from Greater Manchester, that was my grand's name, funnily enough, wrote to say she arrived in England in 1952 from East Berlin. She came to join her father, who'd been a prisoner of war in the UK, and decided to stay on afterwards. She says the language was difficult, but she had help from her pen pal, who later became her husband. It's all good stuff. Do check our, uh, do check our website out on that one. Last word from Rob now about what he's up to the rest of the week. Rob? Well, we're in the Midlands all week and tomorrow we're going to take a look at what firms are doing during the World Cup at a lorry firm in Coventry that's saying on big screens in the boardroom for all its workers, rerouting some of the routes for the lorry drivers so they can watch some of the games and make sure everyone gets to a screen. It's a great idea. I hope my boss is watching this bit, actually. On Friday, we're looking at Royal Warrants, how you get them, and we're off to Walsall to see the company that actually makes the handbags for the Queen. That leaves a little gap on Wednesday and Thursday. Now, we do have a few ideas that were kind of kicking around but we are open to suggestions anything in the West Midlands we'd be very pleased to hear from you if you've got a story that you think we should cover get in touch we'll have some of the details at the end of the program don't forget the useful numbers addresses etc we mentioned on the program you'll find them on our CFAX page that's uh, BBC2 CFAX page 238 on consuming issues this week it's benefits and the number to call us on is uh, is 020 8740 Four seven two four. You can write to us at uh, Working Lunch, Room Four Two Two O, BBC TV Centre, London W Twelve Seven R J, or you can uh, or you can fax us on O Two O Eight Five Seven Six Eight Seven Eight Seven Double Nine. You can um, you can email us at Working Lunch at BBC Co Uk. 
Pete from uh, from whom we heard uh, from whom we heard a little bit earlier who joined the RAF in 1952. Um, just going back to his uh, jubilee memories, he said it was a uh, it was eight to the bar. The joint was jumping and it was solid. Jackson, Joe, Loss and a band, and West Brom had a football team. He said he was wearing brothel keepers, and he says remember this. It's a good thought. I wish to finish today. He said, "It ain't no sin to take off your skin and dance about in your bones, and they don't write them like that anymore." He says, "Pete, get absolutely dead right." Join us tomorrow. Bye for now. This mad footage never seen before. She was great fun, amusing, imaginative. Bringing back the memories. Couldn't believe we were going to meet the actual queen. It was like, wow. Meet the amateur filmmakers who got close to Elizabeth. Thousands of people in there. It was buzzing with excitement. And captured the moments that brought a nation together. The mood was one of great elation and joy. The People's Queen, Wednesday at 9 on BBC One. This is BBC Two.